the romantic poets whom we've discussed on this show with my dad, uh, no relation, Andrew Clavin, right, um, have this theory of the imagination and the mind um, that in seeing the world, viewing the world and experiencing it as rich with value and beauty and also, uh, you know, sorrow and suffering, even the, you know, negative qualities, all of the qualitative experience of the world, that man puts the final period on creation, that our role as images of God in creation is effectively to consummate the act of creation. And I've been arguing that this is actually perfectly analogous to what quantum physics is beginning to uncover or suggest to us, right? The idea that the even the particles of our world outside, which we think of as these kind of small gods, right, that behave immutably according to these, you know, neat laws forever and ever on them. And even when we're not looking, they behave exactly the same way, right? Um, it's actually much more strange than that, right? This kind of Cartesian division between our observing mind and this matter that moves around, right, um, is starting to break down as it indeed it must, because in fact, as we know, right, all of our categories for even describing and taking measurements um, depend upon the mediation of human consciousness. When we say or think or casually assume, right, that the particles behind us are bouncing around or whatever, um, we're using all of these visual images or ideas that don't even obtain outside of human perception, right? Things like color or, or vibration, right? Um, these all have qualities that uh, we that are mediated for us, right, by our what what the Greeks would have called our aesthesis, that is the the sensory perception that, that we have, um, and that we can't help but be in this kind of relationship. And it turns out that when we're not in that relationship with the outside world, it's not that it is, uh, it's not that it doesn't exist. And it's not that it has no uh, stable reality at all. It's that its reality completely thwarts and frustrates all of our categories for seeing and understanding. And it's only in relationship with our consciousness that it takes on those sort of ca those final categories. And, um, you know, we've I've talked about this in, in at some length, so I won't belabor it more, but it is incredibly suggestive in, in part because, you know, one of the things that seems to be emerging about um, this uh, way of understanding the world is that, look, so you have these particles, right? They do these weird things like they behave, um, you know, they have wave like behavior and they have uh, particle like behavior. They also kind of seem to occupy, they have many different possible locations and yet they can't really be said to be in any one of them or even in both of them, but rather they have pr a property related to location that is not the same as the property of being in a location, right? Um, these things are again, beyond our language because they inevitably, uh, you know, don't, they, they don't have our categories applied to them yet. Right. Um, and, and yet one of the things that is starting to emerge that might be the case is that um, this idea, which is called decoherence, quantum decoherence, that um, as particles interact with one another, right, they become entangled, which means that information about one of them is, uh, you know, not localized in it, but rather in, in the other particle, right, um, and that we know about the other particle by, by knowing about this particle. Um, and, and as th those particles enter into that relationship, right, they, they take on the kind of stable character that we experience when they enter into relationship with our consciousness, which is right, the kind of the act of observation creates one of these circumstances in which now the outside world is kind of bound with our with our minds, right? 